Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to go over pediatric preventative care. So we'll talk about some of the things that need to be done during childhood to make sure that children grow up as healthy as possible. So let's dive in. Let's start with the most appropriate vaccine schedule in infants, children, and adolescents. Of course, immunization schedules are extremely important, and these are updated yearly by the CDC. So this does change regularly, and you always want to check in on their website uh, just to make sure you got the most up-to-date schedule. For the fact that it does change so frequently, I doubt that you'll be, you'll be tested specifically on exactly when to do things but you probably will be tested on what to do, meaning what vaccines are appropriate around what times. All right, so let's start with Hep B. Hep B is given in three total doses, one at birth, one between one and two months of age, and then one between six and 18 months of age. The rotavirus vaccine is either a two or three dose series, depending on the brand that's given, and this is given at either two and four months or two, four, and six months. Then we have diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. This is given as five total doses. We give this at two, four, and six months, then between 15 and 18 months, and then between four and six years. At some point, a booster is needed. This will typically be, be between 11 and 12 years of age. Now, H influenza type B vaccine is either a three dose series at two months, four months, and 12 to 15 months, or it can be a four dose series, which would be given at two, four, six months, and then between 12 and 15 months. The pneumococcal vaccine is a four dose series. This is given at two months, four months, six months, as well as between 12 to 15 months. And we of course have the polio virus vaccination. This is a four dose series. This is given at two months, four months, between six and 18 months, and then once again, between four and six years. Now, in children between six months and eight years of age who have received fewer than two influenza vaccine doses previously, they should be given two doses of the influenza vaccine separated by four weeks or more. Now, if they've previously received two doses of the influenza vaccine and are between six months and eight years of age, then they can be immunized with just one dose annually. Patients who are nine years of age or above should receive one dose of the influenza vaccine annually. The measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination includes two total doses. We give this between 12 and 15 months, and then once again between four and six years. Now, a specific concern that parents may bring up regarding the MMR vaccine is, of course, the fear that the vaccine causes autism. Now, as a clinician, you need to reassure patients and parents that this entire notion was based on a single paper that was actually exposed to be fraudulent and then was retracted from publication. So, you know, just make sure you know that in case that ever comes up. The varicella vaccine is next, and this is given in two total doses. We're going to give this between 12 and 15 months and then between four and six years. The hep A vaccine is two total doses. We'll give this at 12 months of age or older, and then the second dose is given six months after the first is given. Now, the HPV vaccine is either a two or three dose series. This depends on age. If your patient's between nine and 14 years of age, a two dose series is appropriate with the first dose being given between the ages of nine and 14 years and the second six to 12 months later. Now, if the patient is 15 years of age or above, it's a three dose series. We give this as an, as an initial dose, a second dose one to two months later, and the last dose five months after the first. Now, concerns around the HPV vaccine from parents may include the notion that receiving the vaccine encourages sexual activity. Parents need to be counseled that the vaccines are given at these ages so that the patient is protected prior to sexual activity. There's no studies that show that patients who get the HPV vaccine um, start having sex right away. It's just it's it's a ridiculous notion, and if it comes up, make sure you're able you're well equipped to um, argue that point with your patient. Argue in a friendly manner, of course. Next up, uh, the meningococcal serogroup A, C, W, and Y vaccination. This is two doses total, and this is given at 11 to 12 years of age, and then again at 16 years of age. The meningococcal serogroup B vaccine is also a two-dose series. We should give this at least one month apart. Ideally, though, you would give it between 16 and 18 years of age. So remember, two doses, at least one month apart. The last childhood vaccination is the pneumococcal vaccine. This is four total doses given at two months four months, six months, and then between 12 and 15 months. Now, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and tetanus vaccine, these are the two scheduled childhood vaccinations that are most likely to result in anaphylactic reactions. Now, when an allergic reaction is suspected to have occurred, occurred from a vaccine, skin testing to the vaccine should be performed and interpreted by an allergist. 
When there's no medical reason for refusal, vaccines should be encouraged in all patients, even if the explanation for the importance of vaccination takes up a large amount of time and ultimately may not result in successful vaccination. But vaccine refusal not only increases the individual's risk for contracting preventable diseases, it also leaves communities vulnerable to outbreaks when herd immunity is not present from sufficient immunization. This endangers individuals who are not able to be vaccinated for certain medical reasons. Now, the outbreaks also put a significant financial strain on public health resources requiring personal testing, lab testing, and other control measures that need to be put into place. All right, let's touch on some of the, the childhood screening uh, performed as part of the well child visit. So we discussed newborn screening in detail in the neonatal lecture. So here we'll cover the screening that's performed after the patient leaves the hospital following birth. Now, just to quickly review the newborn screening, we screen for metabolic disorders, genetic disorders, and we do that with blood spot, uh, blood spot testing within 24 to 48 hours of delivery. We also screen for hearing loss, critical, critical uh, congenital heart disease. We look for unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, which we do by measuring the total serum bilirubin levels. Um, so that's what we do before we let them leave the hospital. So let's start with what we do in children, let's start with hearing risk assessments. So hearing is, of course, critical for developing communication skills, cognitive skills, language skills, and early identification of hearing loss can lead to early intervention and better outcomes. At all health maintenance visits and periodically between the ages of 4 and 21 years, patients should be evaluated with targeted questions regarding hearing and hearing difficulties, as well as using screening devices such as pure tone audiometry, autoacoustic emission, or tympanometry. Now, in terms of vision risk assessments, there are specific age-appropriate actions that even incredibly young children should be evaluated for, even before verbal. These include things like turning the eyes and the head to look at light sources between zero and one months of age, to observing toys dropping and rolling away from them between three and six months of age. Any problem with visual pathway development can result in things like amblyopia, which is commonly referred to as a lazy eye. Now, strabismus, commonly known as cross eyes, can be caused by abnormalities in the cranial nerves or the extraocular muscles. Okay, we need to look for this stuff early. Screening to detect visual acuity defects, amblyopia, or strabismus in children under five years, and a vision risk assessment to identify patient history that places them at risk for eye pathology should be performed at all health maintenance visits. Now, for children five years of age and older, a vision risk assessment is performed at all health maintenance visits, and visual acuity measurement is performed at ages 5, 6, 8, 10, and 12, and 15 years of age. Now, the Snellen acuity test is usually going to be sufficient for this assessment. Now, developmental behavioral screening should be performed at 9, 18, 24, and 30-month visits, with emphasis on identifying fine and gross motor problems, as well as communication issues to help us identify language disorders or global developmental delays. We address some of these age-appropriate developmental milestones in the Childhood and Adolescent Growth and Development Lecture. Now, at the 18- to 24-month visits, autism spectrum disorder is screened for by assessing abilities for imitation, joint detention, and group play. Further screening tests are performed in children who screen positive on their initial autism screening. Now for all children, lab screening for iron deficiency anemia is performed and those with risk factors for things like malnutrition or diet low in iron, obesity, prematurity, uh, low birth weight, or symptoms of iron deficiency may require more frequent, frequent lab testing. Now the final screening that we need to cover here is for lead toxicity and then for substance use and depression. So screening for lead toxicity includes evaluating which patients need to have a blood level testing performed, which is ideally performed between the ages of one to two years, as this is the age where peak exposure would occur. Now, this is for children born and living in the U.S. There are many factors to consider when children are immigrants who move to the U.S. with their family. Now, not all patients need to undergo lab testing for blood lead levels. Uh, the patients at risk who warrant lab analysis would be those with any of the following environmental factors. They live in a census area with 25% or more houses being built before 1960, lead paint, or if 5% or more of children one to two years of age in their census area have been identified as having blood lead levels of five micrograms per deciliter or more, or if there is no data or insufficient data in the child's census area on blood lead levels, these children should also undergo blood lead level testing. Now, in terms of screening for alcohol, drugs, and tobacco, you want to start this around 11 years of age and then annually screen for this. 
So screening for depression should begin at 12 years of age and annually in all patients. All right, let's do some content review questions. Your first question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is B. Next question. 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. The correct answer here is D. Your final question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. The correct answer here is A. And that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.